Good afternoon, everybody. Look at that beautiful bird that's just flying over there. The, not that one. That's a virtual starling on the ground just below it is a purple roller. Magnificent. Look at that. Fantastic. Hello and welcome to the special kids safari on Saturday afternoons. My name is James Hendry. I'm now going to smile for you. That is my warmest and most open smile, so please do talk to us. And you can do that by asking your parents to email us on natgeokids at wildearth.tv. That's natgeokids at wildearth.tv. On camera, we have got David Lovestruck Eastall. <laughs> oh, no. And he will be attempting to find what I find with his eyes. There is his thumb. Fantastic. Any questions you have, send them through. We're going to do our best to find you lots of interesting creatures today. Our first port of call is going to be a water hole called Chitwa Chitwa, shortly to be a pond, used to be a dam. And that is because it is, of course, very dry at the moment. And we are going to get a lot drier over the next three months. And that is because we are into the winter, and the winter in South Africa is, of course, the dry season. But you can see, I say it's winter, and here I am sitting in my shirt sleeves, which is wonderful. The temperature never gets really cold here. It's often pretty warm. So, that's our plan. Head down to the water holes, see what's been around. I think the temperature's probably around 26 degrees Celsius or so, 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, there's another bird. Look at that, David. It is a red-billed hornbill. It's now flying away. Apparently, it's actually 28 or 83 degrees. Now, it depends whether you trust Google more than you trust me licking my finger and turning it to the wind. I'll leave that up to you. I trust my finger. Let's continue. That was a red-billed hornbill. Many, many different hornbills that we get here. Well, four. Sometimes five. Right, we're going to turn to the south now. And while we do that, we are going to go across to Trishala, otherwise known as the Three Sleeps of the West. Hello, boys and girls. How lovely to have you on board. My name is Trishala, and I've got Seba on camera with me. And we are on our way to a watering hole also. On days like this, you can see it's a little bit sunny, so it'd be nice to have a look at the watering holes, and hopefully there'll be something around that we can show you. Now, I am going to be driving around in the west, and the fact that I'm in the west means that we might be able to see two special leopards that live in this sort of area. We haven't seen them in a while, so I'm hoping that we'll maybe be able to find some tracks, or hopefully find them. That would be exciting, don't you think? Now, those two guys, their name is Hukumuri, is the male, and Shadulu is the female that hangs about in the west here. So I'm going to be keeping an eye out for them. But of course, I'd love to bring you any big animal that I'd see. I'd really like to see some elephants and some giraffe. What would you like to see? I would really like some elephants. So that's why I'm actually going to the watering hole. I'm hoping that there'll be some elephants playing around for us. Now you can see as I'm driving by, the grasses are a little bit brown and the temperature is starting to drop because now we're in, we're in autumn. So everything's starting to get a bit dry and the bush is starting to change. But we'll talk more about that in a bit. In the meantime, let me send you back over to James with his antelope as I make my way down to the watering hole. Hello again. We have got a kudu, believe it or not, behind that bush. There she is. 
Ah, you can see her looking at us, spying us out with her magnificent little milk moustache. Looks like she's had herself a milkshake or a chocolate sundae. I could do with a milkshake or a chocolate sundae right now. Now, she doesn't want to be our friend for some reason. I'm not really sure why. I think she thinks we're a bit scary. It's probably David's haircut. But what we do have further on down the road here is a little impala. An impala ram who's all on his own. And he seemed to be hanging out with her, probably for safety. Let's just see if we can get a picture of him. Yeah, oh, we thought of can. Maybe there. There we are. Now, this time of the year for the Impala Rams is very difficult because they are filled with the desire to procreate, in other words, to make more Impala with all the mother Impalas. And it's very stressful for them because there's a lot of competition. And that means that they get thin, they stop eating, they forget to look out for predators and they don't like being around other males. And this chap is now very vulnerable on his own. He's in some thick bush. There was a leopard seen around here this morning. So it's entirely possible that the leopard is in fact stalking him. It's not probable, but it's certainly possible. And he'd be in big danger because he doesn't have any other eyes to help him see the leopard, if there is indeed a leopard or a lion, or a hyena. All righty, we're going to leave this impala, head back down to the waterhole. Jamie Paterson has managed to find herself some very shaggy antelope. James is so busy taking up screen time with Impala that we completely lost our water buck, but never fear. I'm going to try and find them all for you again. A very good afternoon to you all. My name is Jamie. I'm only joking about James. And this afternoon, Craig is on camera with me. And a very warm welcome to... <laughs> that was so nice as well. There were so many, so many water buck. Oh, oh well. That was nice while it lasted. And a very warm welcome to the Nat Geo Wild Kids joining us this afternoon. It is lovely to have you on board. Remember to get your questions sent through by your parents on the Nat Geo Kids at wildearth.tv email, just in case you needed reminding. I'm going to try and loop back around to see if I can find these water buck again, but they, they're gone. <coughs> they, have, they have galloped off into or away from the setting sun. Oh, we've just heard some exciting news. It sounds as though Aubrey has found tracks of a male leopard that look very, very fresh. So we're going to go and we're going to help him out a little bit with looking for Tingana. And we're pretty certain that it's Tingana. It's right in the center of Juma. And of course, from this morning, it was a... We all knew that he was hanging around. We just... No one managed to find him, which happens with leopards. So hopefully this afternoon, we can actually successfully uh, water buck or mongoose, water buck or mongoose. Which would you like? You can't have both. You got a you got a mongoose. Uh, is that a tree in your way there, Craig? It totally is, isn't it? Yeah, I'd rather it is rather. They were down at the base of the termite mound. Now they are further up the termite mound. Hold on. Let's try this again. Hello, little ones. I love dwarf mongoose. If I go like that, then you can't see any of them, which is exactly what I was hoping for. Come on. If we sit quietly for a little bit, there's a good chance that they'll get curious and come out. I think this is probably going to be our best spot for now. Obviously not, because there is a spike thorn in our way. I don't know why I do that every time I see mongoose. It really doesn't make much of a difference, actually. It certainly doesn't make them any braver. Oh, I think I chose wrong. We should have gone for the water buck. 
was a toss-up. Hello, little one. There we go. That's a little better. Hello, bright-eyed little mongoose. I always think they look so very, very intelligent in their own way. Curious and mischievous. I was watching the, the SABC rehearsal last night and Trishala actually found a business of dwarf mongoose out and about at night, which I haven't seen before. I don't know why that would be. Typically, of course, they are diurnal creatures and they really do enjoy their early bedtime and late rising in winter. They don't, you, you never see them out in the dark. It was actually a first for me. And it wasn't just one. I mean, one could be easily explained. But it was the whole family. I wondered actually at the time whether or not there was a possibility that there wasn't a snake that had made its way into their, into their, their bed for the night. So they spend their evenings settled down in these termite mounds, in termite mounds that are no longer functioning, or at least in parts of termite mounds that are no longer active. And they spend the night there, but of course, termite mounds give off warmth, and warmth is extremely attractive to snakes, especially at this time of year. That's why at this time of year it's very common to find snakes around houses and cars. Balto says that they, and I'm sorry, I'll have to go with they here, absolutely love these guys. I know, they're so cute. You know what, I really miss, I'm quite excited about the fact that it's winter now because it brings an entirely different aspect to our live safaris, although we haven't managed to find very many animals recently, but that's just how it goes. It's luck of the draw. But I really, really like the fact that with the less ground cover, we get to spend more time with things like dwarf mongoose because we can see them. Obviously, with a termite mound like this, we'd be able to see them in summer too, but the foliage would be that much denser. What do you think, Craig? Should I try going backwards? I think they're all sort of clambering up around the top. Let's give it a go. Now, Stuart wants to know if the inactive termite mounds are still hot inside or if they cool. They retain heat just because of the way that they're constructed. So even if they're inactive, they are still warm. Um, and what you'll often find is that while in some points, so I'm trying to listen to Game Drive Radio with half a brain as well. <laughs> that didn't really help you, did it, Craig? That gory bush is in the way. Mm. What you'll find is that only part of the chimney might be inactive. So there might still be heat being exuded from below the ground but it's definitely warmer than the surrounding areas. Oh, cute, man. Grooming, grooming. Grooming, of course, a critical part of this whole dwarf mongoose society. It reaffirms the bonds between them. And when they do have a, a skirmish, I've done a terrible thing. I've accidentally squashed a Mapani bee and now I feel awful. Um, but when they do actually have hierarchy issues and when the males are competing with the with the other with another male for the alpha spot, they often have grooming competitions. So very non confrontational little creatures. Oh, Rosalind, when you're this small, there are lots and lots of natural enemies to be concerned about. I'm wondering if I shouldn't... No, I'm just going to stick with where I am. Be patient. Uh, they, when you're this small, there's so many things that want to eat them, but they don't taste particularly nice, I think, at least to certain creatures. So I've seen leopards catch them before. We've all seen the leopard, actually, Sindile, wandering around with the dwarf mongoose, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if there have been others since. They often seem to eat them with sort of, we would say in, in Afrikaans, eat with long teeth. I don't know if that is the same expression in in English. Yes, I know, I remember Plonk was, well, Plonk wasn't eating one. He was rolling on one. He wasn't exactly eating it. He was swinging it around in all the other hyenas' faces and making sure he showed it off and how clever he was and the fact that they couldn't have it although he did eventually eat it. Mm, snakes, in particular, 
Snakes will go, especially for the little baby mongoose when they're vulnerable, when, before they have left the termite mounds and come out into the open. Mm, birds of prey. I mean, you only have to see the panic in a dwarf mongoose group when a Wahlberg's eagle flies past to know that this is something that they have learned to expect, attack from above, and that they're terrified of it, and that's why they're constantly vigilant. And the, I would say that birds and snakes would probably be their biggest threat. Monitor lizards. A monitor lizard quite happily go into a mongoose termite mound if it can get its head in and grab a mongoose. Life's tough. Life is life is very tough when you're small. I know all about that, and I know that Trishala knows all about it. In fact, it's quite a small drive this afternoon. Yes, I do know all about it, and so does this lapwing here. Now, this bird is called a black smith lapwing. And you can see it's got long legs, and that's how we know it likes to live near the water or around the water. Have you noticed that birds that have really long legs are the type that live in and around water? Because they don't want to get wet. And the taller you are, the easier it is to walk around in the water. Now, they're just going around the edges because a blacksmith lapwing likes to eat all the little creatures that live along the pan. Little mollusks, little worms. You see how tiny he is. And that's what it's doing right now. It's going around and looking for some food. Now you can actually see that that water has dried out quite a bit and those are the banks that you're looking at now. And you could have water all the way up there but now because it's the dry season, it's a little low. And there's our lapwing. Now lapwings have a really interesting call and that's where they get their name from. And I'm really hoping it'll do it for us. But they're called blacksmith lapwings because of the noise they make. Ah, oh, Tony, you'd like to know what my favorite bird is. I must say I really like a lilac-breasted roller. I think they're very, very pretty. In fact, if we're lucky enough to see one, but I doubt it at this time, then I will definitely show it to you. But they're a very, very colorful bird. And they're very, very pretty. And this lapwing is pretty too, but not as colorful. Now they'll sometimes go into the water just like this and they'll try to move around the soil at the bottom. And when they move around that soil, little bits of creatures just come floating up and then they grab it with the beak. Oh, what scared you? Now, these birds, I was just about to say that you often see them in pairs. I don't know where its partner is, and there the partner has just strolled into the shot too. And they're just chilling out at the dam. A nice way to spend their Saturday afternoon. Oh, Shelley, you say those skinny legs always give you a fright. They can look a little strange at first. And you wonder how on earth those little, little, tiny skinny legs support this bird. But birds are very light. They've got hollow bones. And that's because of, they need to be able to get up into the air, so they need to be light. And that's why they can afford to have these skinny legs. Looking for more food. Very, very cool. Now, we didn't get to hear what he sounds like, and I wanted to play the sound for you. So let me do that so you can listen. Now, they're called blacksmith lapwings, and they have, or the call that they make is appropriate for it. Let me just find it. Where are you? So their call sounds like 
the blacksmith's hammer hitting an anvil. <laughs> Paul, you say you could also be a lapwing because you've got skinny legs and you live by the water. Yes, well, there you go. Your friends should call you Mr. Lapwing as, they, as your nickname now. Well, I'm going to play the sound for you and hopefully you'll be able to hear it loud and clear. Did you hear that? It sounds very much like a blacksmith's hammer coming down on an anvil. And they call quite a bit. This one is being very good. And they'll fiercely defend their eggs and their little nesting sites and their partners. Even In fact, I've seen these lap wings come down on rock monitors and or that are on the banks of the of the rivers, not of the rivers, of the pans. And I've seen them really dive bomb them. That's when they come down right onto them over their head and they try to move them away from whatever it is that they're trying to protect. Oh, he's making it very softly. Ravinda, that's a really interesting question. You'd like to know if I know which bird has the tallest legs, longest legs. I would think an ostrich. I think that's probably the obvious one. Really long ballerina-like legs in those white stockings. <laughs> oh, let's listen. making the noise. How cool is that? <laughs> I love it. I think it's very, very neat. Now they seem to be the only birds that are hanging around the pan. I'm just going to take out my binoculars and have a look at the edges. And I don't see anything. Well, the pan, like I said, is quite low and a bit dry at the moment. So at th they're really only little terrapins bobbing heads. Oh, they're bobbing heads at kind of at the top. Let's see if we can see them. But just in the middle, there's three little heads that are peeking up. Where did you go? Ah, there they are. Look at those three little heads. <laughs> so these are some terrapins that are living here at the watering hole. And they still need to breathe air. So they're not like turtles. They can't breathe in the water, underwater. And they're not like tortoises that live exclusively on the land. They are terrapins. So they live or they have a semi-aquatic lifestyle. So they need to come up to breathe and then they go back down. Bull, you'd like to know why lapwings have their nests in such precarious locations? Well, there's a couple reasons. They're, firstly, their chicks are born precocial. So that means that their chicks are ready to run or rather move and they're mobile and they can feed themselves. So the need for a nest is not really there. And you'll find that lots of birds that have precocial chicks will have an open area in which they will nest. Apart from that, they actually are have evolved in this way to nest in an open area with camouflage. So their eggs are really well camouflaged. They're kind of spotty, very, very spotty. Whereas maybe um, a bird of prey that has eggs up in, in cliff faces or in nests up in, t in high trees, their eggs wouldn't have that kind of camouflage. It would just be white because there isn't a need to invest in that. But lapwings, like these guys here, they just, they don't need to create that kind of investment because their chicks can get up and start moving as soon as they are born. 
very cool. Anyway, we're going to say goodbye to these guys, and I'm going to move on in my on my mission to the west. In the meantime, let me send you over to another watering hole that James Henry is at. We're sitting here at Chitwa Dam. This is the dam that I was talking about earlier. And about three months ago, this island that I'm sitting on was covered in water and the only bits of this tree that was sticking out were basically the bits that are above where I'm sitting here. And so the water has gone down substantially over the last little while and that's going to make life for the hippopotami behind me very, very difficult indeed. And there is not a lot of other water around here. So if they want to find other places to live, they're going to have to go down south towards the Sand River and eventually beyond that to the Sabi River and perhaps even further than that into the Kruger National Park and see if they can find some water holes there. It's going to be a very tough time for them over the next little while. And I know we've mentioned that quite a lot, but this is really puts a perspective on it. There was so much water, so much more water in this water hole that at least a meter and a half, that's about four feet or so of water existed on top of where I'm sitting here now and the rain this year was just simply insufficient to cover it. There are a couple of birds around here. There are some small three-banded plovers over there. Can you see them, David? Yes, you can. Good. And the ubiquitous blacksmith lapwing. And also some recently landed Senegal lapwings. That's what's flying over the water there now. <coughs> And the reason I'm sitting on this tree is, uh, in fact, twofold. One is that it looks quite nice. The other, of course, is that if these hippopotamus take uh, a distasteful view of what I'm doing here, one of them might come out and give me what's known as a bit of a rev, at which point I shall scuttle up to the top of the tree and hope that it doesn't fall over but I'm pretty sure that they will leave me alone, which will be great. Something very peaceful about sitting next to the water as the sun goes down in Africa. And so I'm very satisfied sitting up here on my tree. And I'll just climb a little bit further up, and that's to show you this nest this is the nest of the red-billed buffalo weaver. And we don't often get very close to them. This one has now been vacated, and I just want to look inside. There are a few lizards and things, and they're very uncomfortable-looking places. Now, I'm sure all of you kids go to bed at night in very comfortable feather beds with duvets and comfortable pillows, well, you wouldn't like to be, have been born a red-billed buffalo weaver because you'd have gone to bed in a cavity made of horrible thorns. But it is very safe, of course, from predators, which is excellent. OK. Good. You can hear the hippos just snorting a little bit. They're probably snorting at me. They are territorial, and they're also very defensive over their water. So if they feel like I'm threatening them, or their water, or their access to the water, that will be very dangerous. But I'm not doing that, making myself nice and obvious. Hoping something larger might come down to drink, like an elephant, but nothing has as yet. All right, that is all I have to tell you about this dam attempt to come down and not be eaten by hippopotamus. Yes, I see what you mean. James, you can link to Jamie. Oh, right, OK. Well, I get down here, let us go back up to wherever Jamie Patterson happens to be looking for whatever it is she's looking for. Careful, James. Sounds like a, a slightly dangerous mission he's on there. 
Um, I am all the way up towards Gwari Pan, but I might change my direction because I see there's some nice Ellie tracks coming further to the south and I see some tiny little baby ones. So I might turn around and go back in that direction just to see if I can find them. They look nice and fresh. I'm just looking to see if there's a nice pile of dung. I'm just half again using half my brain to listen to this. It sounds as though the guys are having a seriously tough time tracking Tingana. I've stayed out of their way. I'm circling a loop around them so that I can help them or spot if, if they've missed something on the, on the edge of the area that they're tracking, if that makes sense. There's no point in having multiple vehicles all working exactly the same area because it's not an effective use of one's time. Hmm. But I haven't picked up on any tracks, so I might go back south, go look for some Ellie's. I enjoy elephant sightings. Haven't had one in ages. Oh, sorry, Faith. This radio is insane. I know you just fed me a question, and I know it came from David. And I know it had something to do with a kudu. But beyond that, I am lost. Ah! Now, David would like to know when do kudu rut. They do have a peak breeding season. So they give birth around about the rainy season. So in the next month or so, we should see the male kudus start fighting for access to the females. And that actually continues for a bit more of an extended period of time than it does with something like the impala. So impala have a different breeding strategy. They'll, their approach is a little bit different. They will mate over a very specific limited time period where kudu will have a slightly expanded mating season and it will be coming up very, very shortly. What we should see too is warthog rutting season. That should be starting now. We should see warthog and warthog can fight like nothing I've ever seen before. Warthog proper, a proper serious male warthog fight is scary. It's a hundred kilograms each of angry pig with very sharp tusks attacking each other, pushing each other over, slicing at each other with their razor sharp tushes. This is a phrase I've used many times in the last four years. Razor sharp tushes. It's the bottom tusks that are rubbed to, to sharpness. It is. We very seldom get to see it live actually. In fact I can't think of one instance where we've had a proper fight. Okay, just let me talk on the radio for a sec. <sighs> I give up. I will talk eventually. Sorry, guys. Hi. <laughs> Obviously, what I've got to say is more important. No, please don't talk again. Tax orbs have driven Drakensberg from Batalia up to Gwari Pan. I haven't picked up on anything coming out here. I'm on Gwari Pan Road now. Nothing this side. Unless I missed it. Okay, copy. There's tracks for herd of elephants going south on Drakensberg as well. Okay, sorry, I just had to spit that all out. Now, a lot of you wondering why we don't see warthog fights, apparently. Sorry, back to our original topic of conversation. And the answer to that is I don't know why we don't see them more often. I've seen a few in my life, but somehow it's never happened while I've been live. Now, there's a huge warthog. 
that lives around Gowry, Maine. He's become a little bit of a celebrity because he just is that massive. And we've seen him a few times live, so there's always the possibility that we could potentially see a quite serious warthog fight. It should happen round about now. It does make a lot of noise. It does attract the attention of predators, but even a, even a, a big male leopard will think twice about tackling a male warthog that is hyped up, full of anger and aggression and testosterone. It becomes a very, especially when there's two, it becomes a very dangerous venture. But we should see them. I don't know why we haven't seen more. We haven't seen much of anything, really. A lot of people have been quite upset with us that we've been spending as much time as we have at the hyena den. And the answer, well, the, the truth is that happens every time we have an active hyena den. We, we never know when the hyena den is going to vanish, so we take full advantage of it. But we're not not looking for other animals either. <sighs> and case in point, I haven't found anything, neither has Trishala, but perhaps she'll be able to tell you where she's driving off to. I've also found nothing yet, but I have made it to my western boundary, so I'm checking it out. Now, this is a really nice place to look for tracks because animals that come in and out of different properties or different game areas, they'll cross these main roads. And if we know that this, an animal has crossed the main road into Juma, which is here on my right, then we know that the animal must be inside Juma, which is great. Oh! Man, I said I'd like to show you a lilac breasted roller. Please land for us. And it won't. It's flown off. <laughs> Birds always do that. They know when they're going to be put on camera. But I will try and find you one. Yes, so like I said, we're looking for tracks, anything going in or out. Jamie, you'd like to know how we spot such tiny animals? Well, at first it's really, really hard and we can't actually do it. But then afterwards, when, you're, when your eyes kind of become accustomed to it, you can spot these things quite easily. Even things like chameleons, which at first may seem like it's a really difficult thing to spot. Once your eyes have adjusted to looking for them, you can find them quite easily. And I find that in general with all things, it works that way because let me just let this vehicle pass us. Just pop up on here. So before I did this and I used to work and look for turtles and dolphins and sharks from the air and pick them out, it was very, very difficult at first because you, you don't know a speck in the ocean looks like nothing to you. But as soon as your eyes become accustomed to it, you can actually pick out species from the air. And it's the exact same in the bush. When you practice and you're in the bush all the time and you're looking, your eyes get used to it. It's quite a nice experience because at first it can be truly very hard. But like I said, that's with everything. The more practice you get, the better you get at it. That's also why I really like looking for the little things. And sometimes, and I always say, you can stand in one spot in the bush and it'll look like there's nothing around you. But then give it, give it 20 seconds, count to 20 and you'll look at your feet. And there's so many things happening around. If you just take the time to stop and watch. So I like to do that sometimes, whether it's ants or millipedes or little flowering plants, you never know. Jen, you'd like to know if I witnessed any cool sightings of the ocean from the air. I have seen some really cool things. I have been in the air when the sardine run was on. And the sardine run is when the sardines migrate and they come along the east coast of South Africa and you get a feeding frenzy because sharks are all over the place, dolphins are all over the place, and of course the fish are all over the place. So I've seen some spectacular things of, you 
can see the, the school of fish as a dark sort of patch in the water. And as sharks dart through them and around them, you can see the whole show move. It is very, very cool. I have seen also one turtle that looked like he had just been bitten by a shark and part of the carapace had kind of like broken and all these the soft tissue was coming out so you can see some awesome things from the sky even it's nice because you get to see a perspective that you don't see on the boat very often on the boat you can you'll often see the fish and you can see that there's a shoal next to you or beneath you but from the air you can see i remember seeing sharks approaching a big shoal and the shoal would not have had a chance to know what was happening at that point but you can see them from a while away just approaching and making their way through it's very very cool but i'm hoping that it'll be even cooler if i can find a leopard now i'm also a little bit hopeful about finding the lion now i am when matt had her this morning I believe she went into Simbambili where we can't go and I'm really hoping that maybe there'll be some others around that have decided to take a stroll towards Juma, which would just be epic I think. I haven't seen some lions in a while. Guys I was chatting to you and now I missed my turn but it's okay. We'll take the next one. I'm always hopeful of seeing Shidulu on this side. <sighs> Nothing. I'm always, always hopeful. I've seen her on the side so often. Oh well, I'm sure she'll come visit us soon again. Anyway, I am going to go back since I missed my road, but I can still take this one. In the meantime, let me send you over to James, who's doing much what I am, driving around and looking for something for you. Let us hope indeed that Shadulu makes an appearance on the western boundary. We're heading to our next waterhole, Beefle's Hook waterhole, which is on the northeast corner of where we're allowed to drive. Uh, maybe something will come down there and have a drink, or will have come down to have a drink. We'll just have to see. We'll also be able to see as we drive up this very sandy road if there are any tracks going to or from Juma. Juma is on the left-hand side, that's where we operate. Well done, David. And on the right-hand side is Torchwood. Good. And in the middle is No Man's Land, which is where we are now. Afternoon continues to be glorious, but I can tell you that there is a slight nip in the air Which is going to be slightly more than a nip in about an hour's time Now I'll head into the magnificent Ooh, hang on a second Some tracks here There are some lion tracks here. They're not new though, they're quite old lion tracks. Jamie, you're interested in the difference between male and female leopard tracks. Well, the easiest way to answer that question is to say, how would you tell the difference between a woman's track and a man's track? And I'm pretty sure you're answering that question to yourself now. One is simply normally bigger than the other. And that's exactly the case with a male leopard and a female leopard. So a male leopard is about two, th um, sometimes even double the size, but not normally. It's sort of a one and a half times the size of a female, and his foot is about one and a half times the size of a female. So a female leopard's track would fit into that much of my hand. Ooh, a little bit bigger. And a male leopard track would fit into the whole of my hand. Be a nice, easy palm size so that's how you tell the difference it's very simple actually once you've seen a few of them it's quite simple they look very similar on the screen of course because it's difficult to get a sense of scale just heard some movement there ah that'll be because there's an elephant standing next to us it is a very small elephant to be on its own i wonder where its herd is yeah will they hide they're very good at hiding, or elephants. 
Excellent players of the game hide and go seek. He's just picking up a bit of grass to eat. But I wouldn't say that that elephant was more than eight or nine years old. And so where the rest of the herd is, you would not expect to find an elephant like that on its own. So I'm sure there must be a few more elephants off behind, beyond him, probably. Can't hear any, though. Hmm. Sorry that the bush is so thick. I don't know that we'll get a better view. And because he's on his own, I don't want to drive in there after him, I must say. I think we'll give him a fright because this bush is so thick. Have you got a shot there at all, David? Not really. Let me go all the way back. Let's see if we don't get one through here. There's a little bit of a shot. There we are. Now let's just listen carefully and see if we can hear, perhaps, the rest of the herd, if there is one. Which you'd certainly expect there to be. We can't hear the rest of the herd, though. So the only sound I can hear are the leaves rustling when he walks and the pulling of the grass. Now he's smelling us, trying to assess if we're a threat. And it's interesting because the wind has just blown over my right shoulder towards the left. Yeah, and they've picked up our human scent he or she has, and is not particularly keen on it. You can see how she stopped moving, he or she, I don't know, probably I'm just going to say he from now on. I don't know if it's possible if this is the injured elephant that Jamie had a few, uh, in fact, exactly a week ago. It's possible. Yeah, look, it's limping. It is limping. Yeah, it must be. That'll be why. Now, for those of you who are wondering, this elephant was assessed by a team of vets. It is a natural injury. And so as hard as this is to see, they are not going to interfere. Now, I mean, we can get into the debate about that if you'd like to again. But what for me is interesting here is that the herd has abandoned this animal. And so even elephants with their tremendously caring and normally um, nurturing social environment eventually will leave an animal that cannot move with the herd to itself. Now, from the angle of the tusks, I would say this is a young bull. I also don't necessarily think that this young bull is done for. You know, it might not be able to keep up with the herd, but if it can escape the attentions of predators in this area, and remember that a lot of people don't, uh, or a lot of uh, lions don't realize that they could take on an elephant like this, he's almost big enough to escape their attentions. And if he can just escape the lions and stay close enough to water that he can get to and from without too much hassle, he could survive. 
Shay, and that's really difficult to watch. And if you are one of our younger viewers, I am sorry about that. But we do need to be... We do need to think quite carefully about um, the wilderness and some of the harsh realities of the wilderness and Magic Dragon Wizard, as I said. Um, I do think that this elephant could survive as long as it stays close enough to water that it's able to get to and from without too much trouble and also if it is not attacked by predators. If a very large pride of lions came across this elephant, it could be in trouble. And I think it is slightly older than eight or nine. It's probably about 10 or 12. Shame. It's very difficult to watch, but this happens in nature all the time. And unfortunately, there is not much we could do. It looks pretty relaxed. It's not very tense. I'm glad we didn't try and drive off road after him. <laughs> well, time will tell, I guess, with the poor chap. I'm going to leave him, carry on towards the next waterhole. That's not nice to watch. But good to see that he survived another week and seems to be relatively healthy, I think. Okay, Jamie is watching the sunset and I'm sure she'd like to tell you a little bit more about that elephant because she was the first one to find it, I think. I don't really have too much more to tell you about the Ellie, to be honest, except that I'm glad that it's been found. And I assume, I mean, was this the elephant that James has had now? Because then I assume it's encountered other elephants. There's tracks going straight towards where James is now. I can only imagine that, that he must have encountered them. Not James, the other elephant. I don't know much more than what I've told you. The guys were, it was reported, but of course, then, you know, it becomes very difficult to find. So I'll keep you updated, I promise, with any decision that gets made. We're sitting and enjoying the beauty of the evening. I love, love, love this time of year. It is so gorgeous. An African hawk eagle perched up on its knobthorn tree above where it has been nesting along with its mate. Don't see the mate, though. And it's just so spectacular. It's quite a long while for us to wait for sunset, though. I actually only stopped because it was such a pretty picture. Mm. My word. Sometimes trees just create the most beautiful art when silhouetted like this. And our cameraman, of course. Hats off to Craig. Mm. I wouldn't know the first thing about how to capture something like this. Something for you all to screenshot and keep for prosperity. I think it's a definite contender for the top spots of nicest sunset scenes. We, of course, have been treated by some truly, or two, some truly spectacular sunsets and sunrises. The Mara, of course, as well, contributed her beauty to those moments. I would be quiet, but all you would hear would be my game drive radio chirping away in my ear and the fans of the vehicle trying to cool us down. The, dawn, the evening chorus hasn't started yet. Very, very pretty. I know it's an African hawk eagle, just by looking at the shape, the size, and the positioning. Ellen, I'm really glad to hear that. Ellen says that this is so peaceful and relaxing and that she really needed it. We all have days like that. So I'm glad that we could give you a little bit of peace in a frantic day. I hope it improves it slightly. I've mentioned it before. 
as a guide, I've often had to stop myself and make myself watch the sunset. Oh, I know, tough, eh? Tough life. Just to remind myself that not to take this job for granted. I know. Life is tough. Oh, of course, it's like any job. You know, it comes with its own ups and downs. But where we are cannot be beaten. Oh, wow. It has got even more spectacular. And you know what? I can't really see the definition of those clouds in the way that you, Craig has brought them out with the camera. Jerry said it best, but I can't even remember what Jerry's words were now. It was so long ago. Something to do with sometimes Africa gives you such beautiful scenes, it looks as though they were painted. I wonder if animals ever stop and look at the sunset and think, wow, that's beautiful. Hmm. It's an interesting thought. Birds, for example. How much appreciation do animals have for for beauty? Or is that limited slow I mean this is a really deep conversation. Is that solely limited to human beings? Are we the only creature out here that stops to appreciate where we are? Hello, Tony Stark. Very nice of you to grace us with your presence, Tony Stark. It's always special when we have Iron Man on board. Um, Tony Stark would, says that nature can be harsh, but is also incredibly beautiful. I'm sorry, I paraphrased Tony Stark. I got so wrong-footed by your name that I uh, forgot exactly how you put it, but it was something along those lines. Mm, it is. You know, we see some truly brutal things out here and we see some truly spectacular things as well sometimes it's when you know knowing when to stop and just look and just listen i love this hawk eagle nest i love hawk eagles they're in my my list of top birds i'm not sure if they make top five my list changes sort of every day, depending upon how I'm feeling, but they're definitely high up on my list of favorite birds. I like them, of course, because they hunt together as pairs. And there's something that, as a human being, I appreciate about that sort of level of teamwork. It's probably a very um, romantic notion, perhaps. Spectacular bird hunters. As in, they hunt birds, not they are birds that hunt, although they are both those things. <sighs> wow. Yeah, this'll do, Craig, don't you think? I mean, I've had worse evenings. Saturday evening. Bob is saying that this is the most beautiful sunset that she has ever seen. It's, it is a really, really spectacular. I nearly said to Craig, you know, we should have been here a few minutes later to stop and wait for the sunset. But I, I think that sitting here for the period of time that we have has been entirely worth it because it's just got more beautiful. It really has. Ah, oh, wow. My word. And on that note, that brings us to our Nat Geo Kids Drive. We hope that all of the kids that have joined us this afternoon, or the afternoon for us anyway, have enjoyed it. We will see you same time, same place next week. For the rest of you, don't go anywhere. We'll be back shortly.